big mass. Can you see? Can you see the screen? Yes, perfectly well. Yeah, fantastic. So I'm ha I'm handing over to my colleague. I'll um. Can you see the video? Uh, yes. Yeah, fantastic. There we go. There we go. Stephen and uh, Bala for you. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar today on the PhDs. Um, as Lana was saying earlier on, I studied the PhD at Warwick in History, so I can talk from that side uh, and talk you through uh, how you apply a bit about Warwick, uh, a bit about the research proposal and that sort of thing. Um, we're lucky today to have Bala with us, who's a current PhD at Warwick. Um, now, Bala is studying in the School of Engineering. Um, do you want to say a word or two about what you're studying? Well, hi there. I'm Bala, Bala Guru from Malaysia. I'm currently a third year PhD student and uh, my engineering is on aerospace engineering and my project is sponsored by a company under the subsidy of Airbus. And uh, before, one of the reasons I, can you speak about Warwick? Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, one of the, before, I, before I choose Warwick, I, I did my postgraduate uh, master's in uh, Leicester and before that I did my bachelor's in Newcastle. So one of the reasons I choose Warwick is because of it's highly recommended by my professors in uh, Leicester. It's one of the top 10 in the UK. And for engineering, it's uh, number eight, especially in my field, uh, materials engineering. So if, you, if any of you would like to ask about uh, engineering, about uh, doing a, to, to pursue a postgraduate uh, in Warwick, uh, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. So um, just to cover what we'll um, look at today, um, we're going to start off looking um, at why you might do a PhD. You know, who is it for? Um, what does this entail? Um, you know, how different is it from doing, say, a master's or a bachelor's degree? Um, we've covered just a little bit already, I think, but just to recap on why Warwick is uh, such a good place to do a PhD. Um, now, Bala said in his particular field, it's very strong for engineering, uh, and that's true for a lot of our subjects. So I'll talk through a little bit about social sciences, a little bit about the arts, uh, and then we'll look at science as well. Now, if you're actively considering a PhD, you'll also want to know how to apply. So we'll look at the, the checklist you're going to want to go through. Um, that's going to be a bit more practical. Um, then in the uh, specifics of how to apply, we're going to look at research proposals uh, because they can be a bit of a mystery. You know, what is a research proposal? What should you put into that? Um, is it your own ideas? How much um, negotiations do you need to have with departments? Um, so we'll just give you a bit of an overview there about what the research proposal is. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can then follow that up at the end of the, the presentation. So um, if you're actively considering a PhD, you probably know some of this already, uh, but it's worth just considering what a PhD actually is. Um, obviously it's prestigious, you have um, the highest degree uh, that it's possible to be awarded in the UK. Um, you get two letters in front of your name, so you become a doctor, uh, which is always a, a nice thing. Um, but what would you do it for beyond that? You know, why, why do people choose to do a PhD? Uh, well, traditionally it's been the main route into academic careers. Uh, so if you're considering going into um, professorships and lectureships, it's become increasingly important. Um, at one time you could go into these jobs without a PhD, uh, and it's still possible in some universities. But in the very best universities, you're going to need to have a doctorate to be able to do that. A large number of people go into uh, science and research. Um, according to prospects, 25% of people who do PhDs will go into scientific research. So if you're going into an area like Bala has, um, you know, with perhaps aeronautical engineering, um, it's going to be quite good, not just for getting into to academia, but into all sorts of different uh, scientific uh, research positions. Um, and research and development is an area that has grown as a field in the UK and other countries. And increasingly, other careers uh, need PhDs too. Um, so I'm working in higher education, but I'm not a, a practicing lecturer or professor. Um, what doing a PhD has given me is an understanding of um, uh, research, um, it's given me an understanding of um, you know, how to ask a question. Uh, a lot of teaching you'll have had before will, will give you um, knowledge, you'll have uh, a lot of understanding in my field, perhaps on history, but doing a PhD is a chance to actually ask questions and to actively explore those um, in depth over three to four years. Um, and depending on your subject, hopefully you're going to enjoy what you're doing. Um, it's a fairly unique opportunity to study it in depth over three to four years. When I started my PhD, um, I talked to a professor who says that even when you get on to you know, a higher level um, of academia, there are very few times where you're going to have so much time to immerse yourself into a topic that's really interesting to you. Um, so if you're passionate about a subject, 
uh, if you're interested in aeronautical engineering, business, economics, history, social policy, education, any one of these areas, and you really want to get into a more depth, you know, perhaps you've been inspired by your, your bachelor's or by your master's, a PhD uh, is a fantastic chance to be able to do that. Um, and of course, if you've got funding to do it, that makes it all the easier. So who should do a PhD? You know, you might be considering, you might be on the fence, you should think, you, know, you might be thinking here, is this for me? Uh, am I the right sort of person to be doing this? Um, as long as you're curious, um, you know, you're always asking questions, um, as long as you have uh, achieved a high standard of academic uh, results in your bachelor's and your master's, you can do it, but it's knowing whether it's right to do it or not. The key thing to think of here um, is whether it's for positive reasons or negative reasons. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom here, I've put some negative reasons for doing a PhD, which uh, occasionally people will do. Um, it might be that you don't enjoy your job and you think a PhD is uh, a route out of that, say. It might be peer pressure. You might be thinking that actually a PhD uh, will impress people because you get two letters before your name. Um, you know, it's the highest degree, as I say, in the UK that you can possibly be awarded. So there's uh, a sense of achievement there. Um, but it's also three to four years of your life um, that you'll be spending on this. So you need to make sure it's for the right reasons. Um, I'd also say don't do it if you're just trying to hold on to a visa, um, if you're looking for residency or that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it can be a way of getting into a field in a certain country and it, it can be uh, for positive reasons but it's making sure that your PhD will be for positive reasons um, so you know you might have a career in mind uh, you might want to go into research you might be in the scientific field you might want to work in social policy uh, work for government you might want to take up a lectureship these are very positive reasons for doing a PhD um, and of course if you're very uh, successful in your PhD you can make a difference you know, so if you think that by studying, you can contribute to human knowledge in whatever field you're looking at, it doesn't have to be science, it can be understanding human behaviour, uh, it can be to understand uh, the mechanisms for, for conflict, if you're doing politics or history uh, or one of the social sciences. Um, it might be that actually in engineering or in uh, another scientific field like chemistry or physics, um, you think you can add to knowledge, you make some sort of breakthrough um, these are good reasons for doing a PhD. Not every PhD is going to lead to uh, change, you know, won't change the world probably, but you can incrementally add to human knowledge. And if you have a curiosity to sustain you over three to four years, um, I would say that's a good reason uh, to be doing it. Um, just want to turn to Bala now and see, Bala, why, why did you choose to do a PhD? What, what were your motivations for, for doing one? Thank you, Sarah. One of the reasons I did a PhD was, uh, was to further enhance my knowledge which I gained during my master's and my curiosity of improving my previous research was, which was on super alloys which was used in a, on one of the parts in a plane. So I thought that maybe my research that I did in my master's I could bring it further and after discussing with my professors back in my previous university they strongly advised me I think you should bring it to the next stage and maybe this will be a contribution to knowledge. So that's one of the reasons that uh, I came to Warwick because it's high, highly recommendable uh, for this specific uh, field, especially materials engineering. So that's a, there's an additional point here about um, recommendation. You know, you can either be self-motivated and you can think, well, actually, I've got, got what it takes to do a PhD, um, or you might find that actually you've got academics, you've got um, a lecturer who's, who's positively recommending you go on uh, and you take your knowledge further. Um, so that's an endorsement. If, you, if you've got people telling you that uh, in the know, and it might be, uh, say, an academic, it might be someone in science who thinks you, want, you, um, you, know, you, have, you have what it takes, uh, and actually your contribution to knowledge could be uh, substantial, that's all worth listening to. So recapping here on uh, what Lana covered a little earlier, why, why study at Warwick? You know, what is it about Warwick that makes us uh, a little bit different from other universities? Well, firstly, we are uh, top 100 in the world um, in all three major rankings. So that's the Shanghai, Jiao Tong, QS, and Times Higher Education. Uh, we were University of the Year uh, in Times Higher Education last year. Consistently ranked top 10. Um, and we came seventh in the Research Excellence Framework 
uh, which isn't very snappily titled, um, but what that is, is the government's uh, measurement of research excellence. So the, the government is looking to um, ascertain which universities are doing the most compelling, um, the most world-leading research. Um, so what the university does is it puts in submissions uh, of our research for independent uh, assessment, um, and that found, as it did in the previous assessment in 2008, uh, the Warwick is seventh in the UK. So um, we have we have research quality and depth. 80%, 87% of all of that research was either classified as world leading or internationally excellent. Um, so what that means for you as a potential PhD is that your supervisors are leaders in their field. Um, you can be fairly certain that whoever you have as your supervisor, they will either be uh, perhaps a new lecturer who is just starting, that they're at the cusp of, uh, of new knowledge, um, or they might be a more established professor um, who's already built up a large body of work over several years. Um, so what do um, PhDs um, do? Well, as well as academia, we are a fairly successful university in terms of getting graduates into uh, some of the biggest companies, uh, both in the UK and abroad. Um, amongst the UK's top 100 graduate recruiters, um, our graduates are the third most employable. And we are 19th in the world for our reputation with employers. So if you're looking to stay in the UK, or if you're uh, looking to perhaps move back to Russia, as I imagine many of you will be, um, if you're going to be funded, um, we have a fantastic reputation with employers. You know, they know who we are. Um, and you can be fairly certain that your degree, your PhD, uh, is going to help you get a job. Um, now, this is an area where Ballard probably knows slightly more than I do. Um, this is um, PhDs in the sci sciences and medicine. Um, in this slide, I've just tried to highlight here a little bit um, those areas where Warwick is particularly um, renowned. You know, we have a, a, an established reputation. Uh, so these are, include areas such as behavioral science, sustainable cities and energy, food security and crops. Uh, now, Bala's already mentioned material science. It's a, it's a very large area for Warwick. So in chemistry, areas like um, polymers. Um, in physics, areas like crystallography. Um, big data, statistics, pure and applied maths. Um, and science and technology for health. Um, now, just glancing at the list, this list, you'll see that you know, some of these are, are fairly major global issues. Um, and we have at Warwick 10 global research priorities. Um, so areas such as sustainable materials, uh, the science of cities, um, food security, you know, big areas here in terms of how we're going to feed the planet, um, in terms of how we're going to create the infrastructure for a growing population, and also in terms of new manufacturing, materials, uh, automotive industry, uh, the aeronautical industry. Uh, there's a, there's a lot, lot here that Warwick is, is working towards. Um, did you want to say anything about uh, your particular area or about um, uh, what, 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 is your, what is your work leading to? What, what do you think? Um, um, uh, I'm currently uh, researching on uh, next generation uh, materials for, for planes, which will make the plane light as, as much as 30-40% lighter, which means that the plane will be much more bigger. It will be bigger engines and uh, we can carry more passengers. But that takes a lot of time of uh, testing new materials. And, uh, and Warwick has a very good reputation in this particular field, material science, because uh, it's one of the highly cited publications. Every, every year, at least, what, 50 to 60 uh, highly cited papers are being published by Warwick universities, especially in my field, engineering. So that's one of the reasons I came here. So uh, this is one of the reasons. And then also, most of our professors are here, world leading, especially Professor Richard Dashwood. He says, so he's, he's basically from Imperial College. And he came here and started his group the last uh, 15 years. And under him, there's about 20 of us. So the, one of the reasons uh, Warwick is quite a highly reputable university is that we've got, we got uh, world-leading uh, professors and researchers here working together. So PhD is going to be a fairly small area. You'll be asking a question that contributes to a much larger problem. So the example that Val has given there about uh, having lighter uh, materials to use in planes, uh, it has business applications in terms of cost, um, in terms of the environment, you know, having lighter planes that perhaps burn less fuel. Um, so some of the big global problems that Warwick's trying to solve, as PhDs, you can help contribute towards. 
Um, and that's very evident in the sciences. You know, there's very tangible outcomes you can have from doing a science PhD. Uh, now, I studied a PhD in history, um, and we're dealing again uh, with an education, social policy, and the arts uh, with really big global problems, um, you know, really big global questions. Um, we have much the same as we're saying here with Richard Dashwood in a very particular area of engineering. Uh, across the arts and social sciences, we have uh, breadth and depth and quality. So a lot of our departments are rated number one for research um, for world leading publications in particular um, across Warwick, including English, history, theatre, film and TV um, and others as well. Um, and when you're doing a, a PhD in these areas, um, you're dealing with big questions perhaps of democracy, um, big questions to do with uh, citizenship, um, that can link to the sciences in some way. So, I mean, food security is a good example of that, where you have political questions, you have economic questions, uh, but you also have scientific questions in terms of the crops that are being produced. Um, so that's an area where actually life sciences and the social sciences, and potentially the arts as well, in terms of uh, famine, the history of famine, uh, the history of famine relief, the history of charity and uh, NGOs, uh, they can all come together. Um, so although we've divided this into two slides here to show you sciences on one side and then to show you education, social policy and the arts on the other, um, you'll probably find doing a PhD will, will be much more interdisciplinary than previous study. So you'll become an expert in a particular area, but you'll also be expected to look very wide uh, and very far beyond your PhD as well to take into account the contexts um, and the relationships between what you're studying uh, and a wider global significance. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, um, but hopefully it makes it much more exciting than just, just picking a particular question and spending three to four years focusing on that. You're gonna be thinking there about the implications of that question in a very broad context, uh, and either doing very broad reading um, or potentially um, you know, getting scientific expertise that's gonna help you understand that um, in, in as much depth as possible. Um, so now we're going to look just very briefly at the different types of PhD you can study. Um, I applied for an individual PhD. I applied for a scholarship with the Wellcome Trust. Um, and Bala has applied for an advertised PhD. So a, a project that's been put online um, where they're looking for a particular research to fit into a larger research group. Uh, so I'll talk just briefly about the individual side. And maybe, Bala, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about your experience with the the advertised PhD you applied to? Yes, the advertised PhD is basically, uh, which I applied is under jobs.co.uk, which is one of the subsidiaries of uh, Warwick University's, uh, University's own company, is based in the Warwick Science Park. And uh, this, uh, this scholarship was offered by, by the professor together with the ESPRC, which is the UK Engineering Council. And before I applied, I had to prepare a research proposal, which took me about five to six months. How can my research, my future is going to contribute to knowledge? And this was held by the professor himself. They told me how to write a proper one. And then I came to the postgraduate hub by, to the University of Warwick, where they helped me out to prepare it. How can I prepare? What kind of questions do I need to answer? And that took about, uh, about a month. And after that, I submitted my application in uh, June. And then uh, I started my uh, PhD officially on uh, end of October. So that's how the procedure of uh, applying for an advertised PhD online. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you proactively looked for a, an opportunity yes. that fits your interests yeah, and exactly. you've, you've applied to that. Yes. Um, in my case, it was quite different because I had um, an academic who recommended I was going to apply. She, she was suggesting it would be a good idea if I was interested in applying for a PhD to apply by a certain point in time, um, first to the University of Warwick um, and then to um, different funding bodies. Uh, so I applied to the university, I think I applied to the AHRC uh, and to the Wellcome Trust. Um, and it was the result, so that was in about April uh, of the year I applied, uh, which is relatively late. Ideally, you'd probably be applying a little bit sooner than that. Um, it's just that the funding competitions I was going for um, had a slightly later deadline. Um, and then I think I got the acceptance in July, and then I started in the October. So it can be quite a quick process. Um, but the thing with applying for an individual PhD is that you don't necessarily have a standard deadline. If you search online as Bala has, you'll probably see there's a 30th of June deadline, say, and we'll see an example in a moment of, of one of these. 
Um, with an individual PhD, you're more likely to find that you can apply throughout the year, but you've got to be aware of quite when these funding deadlines will be happening. Um, so I know in the Russian context, you may well have uh, funding here that you can apply to um, that will be to a set deadline. Um, and although you can apply to work throughout the year, you're going to need to make sure that you've got you know, everything lined up in order so that you're ready to apply at the right time to be accepted to start in October um, or possibly at another time of the year because some departments will start in January, say. Um, so as an individual uh, PhD, I uh, came up with questions. Um, rather than applying to a project where the scope was very predefined, I came up with um, a question in history that I thought hadn't been answered. Um, and then I put that together as a, a formulated research question, uh, a research proposal with a set of timelines and a methodology to go with that. Um, and a research proposal is, is essential here. You know, if you're going to get funding, if you're going to get uh, the endorsements of the university to accept you as a PhD uh, doctoral candidate, you're going to need to have a fairly well formulated um, research proposal. Um, I'll emphasize this in a moment when we talk about research proposals in more depth, but it's worth emphasizing that actually supervisors and your prospective supervisor can help shape that proposal. Um, so although it's, it's an individual PhD, it's focused on your ideas, uh, your approach to methodology, um, and your um, you know, grasp of the, of the topic, it's also linked to what the department you're applying to already specializes in. Um, it's linked to what the department is looking for, the sorts of PhDs they particularly want to supervise, um, and the very specific expertise you're going to be wanting to have to support that project to fruition. So there's, there's nothing more essential um, when applying to an individual PhD than finding the right supervisor. Um, okay, lots of circles on this slide. Um, this is an example of a current advertised PhD studentship. Um, this is one that is closing next week on the 30th of June. Um, and just to emphasize here the interdisciplinarity um, of some PhDs, this is business school at Warwick collaborating with hospitals in the local area. So it's, it's a social science linking to medicine to answer questions um, around um, workforce management, uh, about efficiencies within the, the NHS. Um, the application itself uh, will speak for itself, so it's, it's worth looking for um, eligibility, closing dates, these sorts of things. Um, read through the project specification uh, to make sure that you do fit the bill. Um, and there'll be a very defined procedure in terms of, of getting in touch with that department. Social sciences and arts, as I say, are a little bit different. Um, they offer greater autonomy and you very quickly become the expert. Um, but it's in a different way. It's, it's a collaborative process yet again. So you're, you're probably dealing with fewer people. You may have one supervisor, you may have two supervisors. Um, but it's going to be an exchange of knowledge. And by the time you finish your PhD, um, actually much the same uh, with a science PhD, um, you will become the expert. You know, you'll be the person who knows most about that particular topic. It might be quite a specific topic, but you will be the, um, the expert in that area. Um, at Warwick, um, we have shared offices. We have um, a, a large library. We have a dedicated space for PhD researchers uh, in the form of the Wilson Research Exchange. Uh, and this is a space that offers uh, so it's computers, um, but also uh, there's, there's a space there for hosting workshops and conferences, uh, a lot of technology that you can use uh, to set up your own meetings, set up your own conferences and your own research partnerships and collaborations. Um, there's lots of seminars that happen. Um, they happen in the sciences to some extent as well. Uh, there are very major parts of social sciences and the arts. And this is where, as PhDs, you'll come together with academics, um, some master students and some potentially some undergraduates even. Um, but particularly, it's, it's PhDs and academics discussing problems. Uh, so you find you're more of a peer when you come to, to do PhD. It's much less you being told stuff uh, and much more about uh, an open dialogue and exchange of ideas between you as a researcher with your own independent standpoint and academics who've been in that field for longer, but may not have thought about these problems in quite the way that you're beginning to approach them. Um, and if you want to travel, obviously if you're coming from Russia, you'll be traveling anyway, um, but you can travel further. So often PhDs will go on conferences, 
Um, I've got friends at the moment in the US who are on conferences, some in the Far East. Um, you can go on research trips as well. Um, if you're in the arts, there's a partnership here with the Newbury Library in Chicago. Um, we have a base in Venice. So if you're doing history of art and history, those are a particular um, focal point. Renaissance studies is the same. Um, and that's what Venice looks like. Uh, I'm sure you, you know that already, but there we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the practical nuts and bolts of how do you apply for a PhD. Um, this is the checklist that we uh, publish, we put out there. Um, the thing to say about this is there is no absolute standard route to applying for a PhD because it is a collaboration. Um, it's uh, something that you will work on potentially with supervisors even before you've formally submitted an application. So the first thing to do is to decide on a research topic. Um, now this might come from your own, maybe if you're working, you've got ideas from your workplace. If you've been studying and you've been doing a master's or a, or a bachelor's, you may have encountered ideas there that you thought, well, actually, I'd like to explore that in more depth. Um, but you don't have to have formulated this to any great extent. Um, at the very first stage, you're just coming up with ideas, topics that you find interesting, um, and ideally just starting to think about questions that you want to answer. You then contact your academic department, and I'd say step two is pretty much the most crucial thing you'll do uh, on this checklist, um, because that's where the exchange starts. That's where you'll have ideas, but you're trying to bring it together with what the academic department is looking for. And the thing to ask at this stage is to ask about research focus. Um, do some research before you contact the department. Make sure that you have an understanding of quite what it is. Um, you know, say, well, if you're applying for business school, you'll want to know that they're big on uh, accounting and finance, marketing, human resources, um, behavioral science, uh, lots of other areas besides, but make sure you understand precisely what the Department of Warwick offers, uh, what the research focus is at our particular university, and start trying to exchange there your ideas and how you want to work with particular academics or in a particular research group. Starts a short-lived short academic staff and projects. And this might be at other universities as well as Warwick. You know, just make sure that it fits, that, that we have the correct match for what you're looking to do. Um, make sure you, that you then draft a coherent research proposal, and this is the other really important thing that you'll be doing, and I'll talk about this in a moment. Make sure you check the admission requirements, um, and at Warwick that's typically um, a good two, one, or a first, um, but it does depend on the, the discipline. So just check our prospectus and check online. Um, then check language requirements, get two referees together, and you're pretty much good to go then in terms of submission. Um, the, the, the key here, apart from your own ideas, is to find somebody you can work with. Um, we do often do uh, co-supervision at Warwick. We organise so that you have more than one supervisor. Um, and that can be a good idea in terms of getting different sorts of expertise into one place to support your project. Um, but ultimately what you're looking for here is a supervisor who will be all of these things. They'll be a good academic mentor to help you with your future career. You want someone who's going to continue to inspire you as you plough through three to four years of your life doing a PhD. Um, hopefully you'll pick a topic that continues to excite you. But sometimes you want a supervisor who's going to keep re-energising you, keep giving you new ideas, new questions to explore. So look for someone who's got that dynamism and that, you know, that sense of... Uh, of a love for the topic. You want an academic who's continuing to love the topic that they're doing so that you will too. You want someone who's going to continue to support you. Um, Bala will probably tell you that a PhD is pretty, pretty tough work. Um, it's, not, it's not an easy ride. It's not, uh, you don't get a doctor for, for you know, just sitting there and coming up with a few ideas and submitting something. Um, it's hard work to manage your workload on the PhD with conferences, publication, teaching, you know, your PhD can be lots of different things, things that are exciting, but things that are difficult. And you, you need an academic who will continue to support you, uh, give you the, the signposting, but also the, the encouragement, the moral support you need to help you get through um, what is meant to be a challenging and a rigorous process. Um, and ultimately, they can be your careers advisor and advocate. So they can help you find uh, a job, and that doesn't have to be in academia. Um, chances are you're thinking towards academia if you're, you're thinking of a PhD, uh, but there might be other fields you're looking at. Briefly now on research proposals, um, what we're looking for here is an outline of your proposed research uh, that explains your project's research questions, methods and sources. 
um, and looking to explain with, within this how it fits with existing literature. So you're looking here to convince. When you're writing a proposal, make sure that you're talking about uh, novelty, you know, how your PhD is going to contribute new knowledge, significance, and by this I mean why does your research matter? Um, you know, both within the chosen, your, you, you know, your chosen fields, but also in the wider world. So you know, if Bala's going to talk about the significance of his research, you've got there, you know, I'm going to add to this particular material science question, but it's got a real world significance in terms of uh, the cost of airlines, uh, of environmental sustainability, uh, of fuel use, all of these yes. sorts of things. Yeah. So just, just, a, just a few um, lines there on the, on the significance. So you recognize why doing a PhD is important. It's, it's not just because you want to do it, but it's actually going to make a difference. Um, think about then authority. You know, why are you the right person for this topic? And why is Warwick then the right place for you to be doing uh, this particular research project? So talk about your uh, bachelor's and your master's. You know, how have you excelled in these? Um, to you know, include any indications of excellence, including awards or prizes. Um, if you've done any conferences or you've uh, published anything, um, increasingly PhDs when they apply have already published something. Um, in my field, it's a minority, but in some, it's it's, um, it's slightly it's a, it's a larger proportion. How is it in your field? Is it do many people publish before they apply for a PhD or? Uh, usually, uh, not many actually. Not many. So, not many. engineering or history, uh, or most of the arts, you probably won't publish beforehand. Yeah, exactly. But it depends it's, on it's the, possible. It depends on if you're doing a, a specialized uh, project or sponsored by particular companies. Or, or usually, you have to ask their permission because it's whatever your research that you do, it belongs to the company. It doesn't belong to you at all. So, you know, something to do with patents issues. Like my research, every time I need to publish something, I need to send a copy of it to the co company. And they'll tell you, okay, to publish this and don't publish that, you know, because it's about uh, a confidentiality for the company because they are paying for it. So it's things like that. And also you, you make sure that whatever you publish, uh, it has to be quite uh, fundamental to contribution to knowledge. Yeah, yeah. That, that last point is absolutely significant. It's got to uh, contribute to knowledge in some way. And your research proposal is convincing uh, the reader quite how and why that is. They can vary in length, anything from 500 to 4,000 words. Um, check your department when you're applying to see quite how long it should be. Um, and just to re-emphasize that um, you should contact your departments and your preferred supervisors before making a formal application. So the thing to do here is to contact the department's, um, possibly the resource account, there's, a, there's often a, a prospective student email uh, on our website, and ask them how you should proceed, because it will be slightly different if you're applying to history or for politics, or education, or social policy, or engineering, or physics, or any of these, um, each department prefers a slightly different route. And some will be more formal. You'll be expected to submit uh, a, long, a longer piece of writing about what your research will be about. Some departments will be more like a conversation, where you're talking with your potential supervisors, potentially, about whether the ideas that you've got are, are a good match with what the department's trying to do, um, or whether the supervisor has questions that he thinks you potentially might be, or, she thinks you might be able to um, usefully address based on your expertise. Um, so in terms of how to approach your research proposal, we're just coming to the end uh, here, so we'll, we'll get on to questions just after this slide. Um, so have a think about what perhaps we haven't addressed or any, any questions that you've got. Um, so just finally, how to approach your PhD research proposal. Um, as I say, contact your department and prospective supervisor. Uh, and before you submit anything, just sense check it. Make sure that you've got everything in there uh, that the, the department is going to expect uh, when they're reading it. Make sure it summarizes your objectives, um, and fundamentally this is about research questions. You know, if you're asking a, a question about material science, the question might be, um, you know, how, how do we use nanocomposites to create um, a lighter um, fuselage for a plane, for instance? Um, it could be, uh, you know, in history, um, you know, what motivates violence? Why, why does genocide happen? You know, it would be a, a much more nuanced question than that. So you'll then break down that question into much smaller subcomponents. Um, and the thing to do is to make sure that it's feasible so that in three to four years, you can answer that question. So although your research proposal should have a, a big question that's you know, significant enough to, to warrant funding, don't make it too big um, that it's impossible to answer because you couldn't answer why does genocide happen in three to four years because we've spent uh, decades trying to grapple with that question in the social sciences and the arts. 
Um, and your supervisor, when I say talk to your supervisor or your prospective supervisor, they're going to be able to help you here to refine your question into such a way um, that it is more feasible. So it's, it's actually a PhD topic, not a research group. Um, always explain the significance of your ideas. So that's, again, picking out the, um, the real world significance. Um, it does depend on the subject. So if you're applying for um, certain topics, it may be a contribution to knowledge within that field. It doesn't have to have an applied real world significance necessarily, um, but it certainly can help if you can draw that out. Contextualize your plans within a wider literature. So make sure you're doing reading ahead of time wherever possible. Uh, departments will understand that you don't have necessarily access to large academic libraries. So you don't necessarily have to get into the, uh, you know, the depth of, uh, of literature if it's, if it's not uh, feasible for you to do so. Uh, again, talk to your academic department. They may be able to, to, to supply PDFs or uh, suggest free, free libraries where you can start doing some of this stuff if it's a, if it's a, a literary-based project. Uh, of course, the sciences will be quite different from that. Um, name relevant supervisors and talk about their publications where you can. So look, look at the website, look at what they've published. The titles alone may give you a bit of a sense as to how your ideas will match uh, and pair up with theirs. Um, so then your research proposal is, is harmonious, you're writing about this as being a group, uh, effectively a group uh, collaboration. You'll work independently on your PhD, but you'll have a supervisor um, whose expertise is appropriate uh, for, the, for the project that you are proposing. Uh, and finally, this is my supervisor's tip when I was applying for funding, use definite language. So it's tempting to be a little bit humble when you're putting something in to say, I would, I would like to, I, was, I, I hope to do this. The thing to do is to say, I will. You know, be absolutely definite that your project, when you've started it, will address these questions. It will use um, this methodology allowing for um, an empirical approach to research. This project will explore these big questions um, you know, and, and make it very definite. So that's our presentation. Um, I hope now we have uh, some time for some questions. So whatever you've got about um, you know, how do I apply, who should be applying, what are the differences between the arts and the social sciences, these sorts of questions. Thank you very much for your amazing presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Comments and information, guys. Please type your questions. No question is silly, as Lana always says. So please use this opportunity. Especially if we have um, engineering students. When I was looking at the registration, I've seen a lot of um, um, students who are interested in engineering, but even if it's um, teaching education or economics or any other field that you're interested in, any, absolutely any question, this is your opportunity to talk directly to um, to these two uh, people who actually can advise you. Um, might take a while to type in a question. Well, yes, a well thought question will take time. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's just saying that any question, you know, it doesn't. There, there is no silly question, and that's what research oh. is. You know, there is, there is no silly question. You have to, you have to ask questions. To, um, well, we do have a question. Really good question, yes. Yeah. Who asks uh, if there is any age limits for PhD students? It's in Russian, so I'm, I'm just... Yeah, that's a good question. We've got a couple, couple here then. Um, no, that, no I, I applied, so I, I, I worked for a while and I came back to Warwick as part of a plan to do my master's and my PhD. So I was, I was a mature student when I applied. And I think you've got someone in your department who's 44. 44. 44, yeah. So, so age is not a limit. It's just that uh, whether you want to do it or not. <laughs> Yeah, and, so, you, and also what kind of research that you want to pursue in the time that you want to commit yourself for the next four years at least. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it can be an advantage, you know, you can come to a PhD with real world experience. Yeah, you know, exactly. you've, you've worked, you've got uh, an understanding of what the real world needs from your research. So yeah. it can be a good thing. Yeah. Is there any help? I guess it's, uh, it's financial help for PhD students who, who come, the students who come with families? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, on campus, we've got uh, a free nursery, so we have uh, already facilities for people with families. Um, you can also get accommodation on campus. So that there are facilities specifically geared up in recognition of the fact that PhDs will often be 
um, by virtue of the fact you've done degrees before you'll be a bit, bit older and you may well have families. Um, in terms of, the, of funding, um, it's possible that uh, certain departments may offer support, but it's, it's going to probably be on a departmental basis. Um, I'm not aware of any that are university-wide, um, but the key thing to do here would be to contact our graduate school. Uh, so uh, my colleague Nicola Ellis-Thomas deals with PhD scholarships. Um, if you talk to her, she may well know of, of funding that does exist. What's her name? Nicola? Uh, it's Nicola Ellis-Thomas. I'll, I'll, I'll send the details, Maria, so you can Okay, circle. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Timur and uh, some viewers also wondering if there is um, any source uh, with good research proposals, like examples, templates, drafts, anything. Did you want to yeah, yes, usually the professors, they'll give you a, a draft or an example of it. And uh, de uh, it also depends on the subjects, but usually they'll provide, most of the professors, they have a copy of it. Mm -hmm. And based on that, you need to modify it. And then you need to put in your own uh, key points, how can, uh, well, what kind of research that you want to do and how, how to pursue it. Usually it'll be like uh, six to seven pages. Does it mean you have to find the professor first and contact them and ask them for some uh, sort of example? Or how, how would, how would usually you can contact the department, either the department will provide you. Yeah, yeah. Like in my case, I contacted the department and they referred me to the professor, so it's going to be my supervisor. Yeah. And he gave me a couple of drafts. Yeah. And based on that, I formulated it and then passed it back to him. He corrected it and then that's how we started it. And usually before you start your PhD, usually if you're far away, like in Russia, you have a very short Skype interviews. Most of the professors in the engineering department, they prefer to know you in person. Usually the Skype interview will be like 30 minutes to one hour. So when you're available and then they arrange it and you can chat with them asking about the projects and how you want to do it because you're going to commit four years of your life. So you can ask the professor any type of question. And usually they are more than obliged to answer any of your questions. And they, they, most of the professors prefer to do a Skype interview rather than uh, answering email questions because they prefer to see you uh, in person before you actually start anything. Yeah, I've heard the same of other science topic uh, subjects as well, like physics. I yes. think they do the same. So. Yeah, Skype interviews. Yeah. Usually, yeah. usually with one professor or two professors, they question you and what your background is and why you want to do a PhD and mm -hmm. things, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah my, my experience is exactly the same where I had an academic in the department who had uh, examples of very good research proposals and they weren't necessarily in, the, in a related topic area, so it's not like you'll be... There's, obviously we don't want sort of plagiarism happening so they, they will probably give you something that's quite different but it'll just give you that sense of um, you know, how you formulate it how it's structured, whether you put timelines in, where your questions go and all, all of that sort of thing Splendid, we have um, two more questions uh, one from Tim, oh even more questions, more questions. Fantastic, good yeah. um, Should I read it or you can read it uh, Yeah I, I, I can read these last two questions we have. Oh, we've got another one. There's another that keep coming. Fantastic. Um, okay, so we've got um, what may PhD students be occupied in uh, and may, may work uh, as a student, uh, as a PhD student, as an assistant. Um, it's very common. Um, it'll be different between the sciences and the arts, so I suppose it'd be worth us explaining that distinction. Um, as a PhD, I worked um, as a, um, a teacher on one of the survey courses in history. So you'll be a seminar tutor. Uh, it's really good teaching experience. You know, so it's it's two things at once. There, you get funding for you know, you get money for doing. You get paid for the hours that you work. Um, you get experience. Secondly, um, of actually doing the job. You know, you've got to be um, potentially a lecturer. You give lectures, lectures sometimes. Um, you can give um, seminars. So you'll be leading these to large groups of, uh, of undergraduate students uh, or smaller seminar groups. Um, so it's it's really good. Uh, experience as well as being a uh, way of getting some money. Um, I think in the sciences you, you do, it's similar but it's a little bit a little slightly bit different. different, different. Yes. Yeah. Usually, usually you'll be working with the professor, most of the professor in engineering, usually they work as a consultant for companies. So they have projects, like small projects, big projects, and you'll be assisting them, like uh, collecting data and, and, and writing, uh, writing the engineering reports. And usually they'll pay you by uh, hours, like uh, 10 to 15 pounds, it depends on the projects. Or some projects, sometimes you need to help them doing the exam uh, as, as uh, exam invigilators. You get paid for that as well. So there are a lot of opportunities to work in the universities. 
yeah. as long as you have the time for it actually that's the most important yeah 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 because i was going to ask about the time yeah, how the time. many hours do you would you normally like work in a week or how how would that sort of fit into well your... most in my department engineer we come to office uh, 8 8 30 to 9 o'clock and then we'll be at in the university uh, lab usually up to 9 9 o'clock because uh, as engineering you need to do a lot of research mm -hmm. in the labs so you you spend a pretty much a lot of time in the labs and after that when you go back and you start reading the papers try to combine your data that you get, you got with the, with the research which has done previously and then how you can improve your research. So basically you spend about at least eight to nine hours in universities basically if you're a PhD student in science and that's what most students do here. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. a lot of reading and a lot of lab works and stuff like that. I think that goes for any, any type of PhD. You spend a lot of time. It does, yeah. 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 Treat it like a full-time job because it affects Yeah, everything. exactly. So nine to five. And then, uh, yeah, especially in engineering, I mean, in science, uh, usually you have uh, monthly meetings, weekly meetings with your professors to update them, what have you done so far, and if any correction has to be made. So you get a lot of support in the university, especially in Warwick University. Most of the professors, uh, they would like to meet you in person to see uh, what have you done so far, and they'll guide you. There's proper guidance here. And also there are a lot of uh, courses here, like time management courses, how to write your thesis, and it's organized by the postgraduate uh, departments. So you, you have a lot of support here, so not, not to worry about it. Yeah, just to add as well, if you're talking about assistantships, um, you can work as a seminar tutor, but you might find that your supervisors also have research projects they're doing, uh, and you can do some, some research with them. And it could be, say, public engagements, it could be, um, I'm thinking more about the arts here or social sciences, but it might be that you're, you're doing outreach work, uh, it could be theatre performance, um, it could be public engagement for the sciences, you know, it could be sort of, uh, engaging with school children, putting physics out there, saying rockets and things exploding, you know, it can be uh, all sorts of things that, that bring your research to life. Um, so it's not like you're just going to be working hermetically in one place. Um, you can potentially get, get your work out there. It can be good for your research. It can give you extra money. Um, and it's linking you to the department in a wider sense. Thank you. Oh, questions are coming and coming. Yay! Yes. <laughs> what have we got? So, that, um, may assistants and associate professors take PhD candidates? Um, okay, so that's the first question. Um, um, Irina asks if uh, she can send an email to potential professors in July. She means, are professors usually on leave in July or not? Um, yeah, so there is a question, there's an issue here um, of, of, being, um, of having perseverance. Um, so, if you don't get a reply, um, I would keep contacting the postgraduate um, uh, resource account for that department. Um, it's true that a lot of professors do go on research leave, they do a lot of conferences and they won't be checking their email as much. Um, some academics are very good at keeping in touch, um, some uh, less so. Uh, so what I would do is I would contact the department, keep in touch with them and they're going to help you hopefully to, uh, to make that connection. Um, being an academic is, is a very demanding full-time job, or more than full-time job, uh, so sometimes they are very committed to, you know, to, to other things and it may take, take a bit longer for them to get back to you. Um, and the first, so the first question there was, can assistants and associate professors take PhD candidates? Um, normally, as soon as uh, an academic gets a job, they'll be looking to take PhD candidates. Um, and there are advantages to both, to both having a um, a very well-established professor who may be, may be there for 30 or 40 years, and to someone who's just got their first lectureship. Um, those that first got their first lectureships are likely to be energetic. They're going to give you that support and that inspiration that I was talking about. Um, they're probably going to be publishing a lot of new research. They're going to be at the cusp of new ideas. Um, whereas a professor's got, um, obviously, the advantage of, um, of experience, uh, they will have supervised lots of PhDs before, so they'll, they will know what to do and, and, and how to support you. And they may have slightly better connections to, to the workplace and, and to the, um, careers. Um, the thing to do with which, whichever supervisor you end up with is to make connections and make sure that you are embedded within your department, that you know everyone, you know who to talk to. Um, so it's not like you just have your supervisor to, to advise you. You've got a much broader research community to tap into. Brilliant. Um, next, next question. How much uh, do students usually pay for the accommodation on campus? Accommodation on campus um, is between, this year it's between £81 and £167 a week. 
Um, what I would say here is that most PhDs won't live on campus. Um, so it is possible, as I say, if you've got a family, there is a family accommodation that PhDs will live in, uh, potentially. Um, but a lot of people live in the local area. Um, and the advantage to this, if you're living in, say, Coventry, or uh, Lana talked about Leamington Spa earlier, is that it gives you, gives you some separation from your, from your research. You know, if you can imagine spending, you know, was it eight or nine in the morning until five or six at night in the lab, um, you might want to get away, you know, live somewhere else and have, you know, go to a restaurant, and have, have a bit of breathing space. So um, they, these are lovely, they're, they're different areas that they're lovely in their own way. Uh, Coventry's a, a thriving city. Leamington is a, is a smaller, sort of bustling student um, uh, regency town. So it's a very beautiful place. Um, so living off campus can be can be good for your uh, good for your research as well as for you. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions in Q and A section as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Christina asks uh, if uh, uh, grade point average is important for the admission decision or uh, only master thesis topic and the grade. Oh, I, I guess the grade of master thesis or something like that are uh, of great importance for the admission team yeah I mean because the dissertation if you're if you've got your master's thesis um, finished it's likely to lead quite often from that into your PhD topic it doesn't have to um, but a good mark there is going to convince the department that you're capable of good quality independent research so uh, the better your dissertation is uh, the stronger your candidacy will be for, for a PhD. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's much the same actually as, as undergraduate with masters. You can highlight different areas of your expertise. So, you know, if you are a, if you are a more mature student, if you're, you know, I'm, I'm 35 now and we've got uh, yeah. people in the department are 44 um, who are doing PhDs, you can talk, you know, you've been away from an academia for a while. It might actually be that your your work experience and any research you've been doing more recently is actually more relevant now than your masters, which might have been a few years ago. Um, so there's never ever an entirely um, you know uh, ordered answer to this question. There are, there are different things to take into account. Um, certainly, certainly your grade point average will be important. Um, there, there is a sort of a minimum standard to which Warwick um, is looking to to attract PhDs to. As I say, typically a high two one or a, or a first, um, which is um, I think four to. equivalent to four or four point five from Russia. I so think. four or four point five um, in the Russian system, um, but it's not just about grades. It's also about you as a um, as a prospective researcher. You know, if you're if you're enthusiastic, if you're keen, if you're um, if you've shown competencies, competencies and capabilities in other fields, including the workplace, that's also going to be uh, an integral part of your application. And it's actually, fundamentally, it's about having good ideas as well. If you're asking a really interesting question that academics, you know, engage with and think, well, actually, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Why, why haven't we thought of this, probably, in, in some cases? Um, that's going to inspire them to, to take you seriously uh, as a PhD candidate. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, one more question. What's the percentage of those who applied for... Um, a degree, a PhD degree program, but uh, ended up without a degree. Like um, that's a, that's a very good question, and it's not it's not one that I have an answer to. Um, Nicola Ellis Thomas works in the graduate school. She's more likely to know because they deal with um, you know, the regulation and the management of, of PhDs. Um, so the graduate school will have have those figures. It will depend on the department. Um, in terms of the practicalities and in terms of how the relevance to you as potential PhDs, um, I would go back to, to the supervisors you get. Because if you get a good supervisor, you, you ought really to be able to get through, they, they are there to help you, to supervise you throughout that process and make sure that you do graduate. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, what are the requirements for a PhD student? May, uh, oh boy. May, may there be some requir required amount of articles or collecting credits by passing the courses, courses only? It's a question from Timur. It's in chat. Is it in okay. chat or? In chat, yeah. In chat, okay, yeah. Um, so in terms of publications, is this, is this before applying or is this after? Uh, Timur, could you please specify? Do you mean the amount of articles before applying or after? Before applying. 
Yeah, as uh, I think we alluded slightly earlier on, uh, there's, um, it depends on the departments a little bit. So in history and engineering, you often wouldn't have published anything. You wouldn't have any articles yeah. whatsoever. Um, it's a good idea, and my, my supervisor encouraged me to, to publish uh, book reviews um, and to put, you know, say, a conference report in. Um, it's got the double benefit there of being a publication uh, of sorts. You know, it's much, much, much shorter. It's not peer-reviewed in quite the same way. Uh, but it also shows you're, you're academically engaged with that topic. So um, that, that was a good recommendation that um, my supervisor uh, gave me. Um, anything to add, that was But usually you start publishing only in your third year or fourth year, or some, most of them uh, after you finish your thesis. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really before before that. It's um, not a requirement. That, that's the distinction between the sciences and social sciences. So in the arts and social sciences, often in the second year you'll start publishing. But because science takes longer to reach results, yeah, exactly. it's going to be later on probably till you publish. Yeah, exactly. Also, the science, more the science and engineering students will be, will be concentrating on the thesis rather than the publications. Mm. Mm. That's a good question. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Guys, do you do you happen to have any more questions? Please type them in in chat and Q and A. Uh, whether you have questions on. Uh, PhD or on this scholarship program, please do type them. It's such a real opportunity. Use it. I think we had quite a few I'm, questions. I'm impressed. There's yeah, lots and lots yeah, of very yeah, good yeah, questions. Yeah, very, Stephen, by the way, do you mind if I send the, your presentation to all the, the people who registered? Of course, no, feel free. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, fantastic. Um, it seems uh, we are running out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in case uh, some people have questions after the webinar, uh, can I send them to you? Yes, please do. That'd be great. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, here we are. Is this, is this another one? Oh, uh, we have questions. Another one. Fantastic. Good. Um, Oh, they keep coming. Good. Uh, can you tell me a bit about the CV? How should it be organised? Some publications, but not in English. What should I do? Um, yeah. So um, with a CV, with a, a PhD, you're, you're looking to make this academic. So um, the education history that you have will be important. I would highlight and perhaps move up the publications that you have. Um, I would include things like conference attendance as well. If you've been uh, to any big symposia or conferences or seminars, um, because it shows that you're you're again actively engaged with academia, uh, with the topic, and you're you're engaged with the debates that are already happening in your uh, the area that you might be writing your PhD on. Um, and I don't worry too much if, if your publications are in other languages. Um, that's a, that's a, probably a good thing actually. And when, when I talk about REF and about our our excellence in research, the phrase that's used there is world leading. Or internationally excellent. Um, so, you know, very much what we're focusing on here is research that reaches around the world. And if your research has already been published in other countries, um, it'd be great to have that in, in the UK and for us to connect to that. So, be brilliant. Um, and there's a, may, may there be uh, any PhD student communities in Warwick or on Facebook? Now, this is one, Bella, do you want to talk to this? Yeah, so we have one in uh, actually a couple of them, not only one. That's for engineering, that's for science, it's called a postgraduate graduates hub. Is, uh, another one is postgraduate students, Warwick. So there's a couple of it actually. If you just type Warwick postgraduate students, a couple of it popping up. I think one say there's nearly about 12 of it. Yeah. That's, my, that's on the last count. It's further up. But you need a quite specialist group, like for maths, they have different groups and subgroups. For engineering, there's materials group and uh, thermoplastics. And then for what do you call uh, polymers, so the different subgroups are there. You need to be like, uh, Usually they're coordinating, they'll be coordinating with other different departments of other universities so they can share information and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So if you type in and Google, Google yes. they, they sort of, the yeah, words will be able to find it. Usually if you just uh, click on search on the Facebook itself, you can see all the groups. Yeah. And you can even see Warwick, uh, post-project group, and then the different universities. So there's quite a lot of groups, so it's easy to find. Yeah, I can share the, the two main university ones, which are at Warwick Uni. Um, and then Warwick Postgrad, at Warwick Postgrad. Yeah, that's quite popular um, ones, yeah. So that, that'll tell you all about the university, everything that's happening, all about sort of new research rankings, new research that's taking place, um, sometimes scholarships and sometimes um, you know, there might be uh, research projects that are coming up that will be posted there. Yes. Um, but it's a really good idea, like I was saying, to connect to your 
particular departments, you know, because they'll often have a, a Facebook group or a, a Twitter group. Um, and also they advertise a lot of uh, jobs as well. <laughs> yeah. On, on Facebook? Yes. On the postgraduate guys. And some of them already start working and uh, they have uh, new openings in the companies. So usually they'll highlight all the groups so that uh, they can share. So you can apply for jobs or as soon as you are about to finish your PhDs. So that it's, it's more like a platform to share information, up-to-date information. Amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll try and compile all the sort of links together, Maria, for you and just send it over and um, send over the presentation as well. Thank you very much to Stephen Abala for us. It's, 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 I, th I think it was very insightful for the, for the applicants as well. And we've received a lot of questions. I didn't, ha I didn't count how many, but from all the webinars we've done with Maria uh, together, I think that's the most sort of uh, amount of questions that we received. <laughs> it's encouraging because PhDs ask questions. That's good. Very that's good. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Сейчас быстренько поговорим про программу «Глобальное образование», про то, как вы можете профинансировать ваше обучение по программам PhD в 32 странах мира в 188 университетах. Программа выполняется по заказу Министерства образования и науки Российской Федерации. Оператором программы является Московская школа управления Сколково, где я сейчас нахожусь. Программа была запущена в 2014 году, в конце 2014 года, если быть точнее. И пока у нас срок реализации намечен до конца 2016 года. Но вы не расстраивайтесь, не пугайтесь. Мы сейчас ждем прям буквально со дня на день документов о продлении реализации программы. Как только мы узнаем об этом, мы с радостью вам сообщим. Поэтому пусть это никак не повлияет на ваше решение поступать и подавать заявку на программу. Если есть такие люди, которые еще не, не знают ничегошеньки про программу, никогда наши вебинары не слушали, быстренько расскажу про основные параметры. Мы финансируем только graduate level, это магистратура, аспирантура, про которую мы сегодня будем говорить, и ординатура. Финансируются только пять направлений обучения, наука, образование, медицина, инженерия и управление в социальном секторе. А внутри этих пяти направлений есть 32 специальности и огромнейший список а, специализаций, так что а, пусть вас сразу не отталкивают эти пять научных, пять, прошу прощения, направлений, которые мы отобрали для финансирования. Пожалуйста, изучите наш список на нашем сайте vacationglobal.ru, уверена, что-нибудь себе подберете. А, как я уже сказала, вы можете по нашей программе обучаться в 32 странах мира. Великобритания является одной из финансируемых стран. Почему я вспомнила про Великобританию? Сегодня к нам подключились коллеги из Орикского университета. А Орик у нас находится в Великобритании. Помимо этого, если я говорю, вы 31 другая страна, можете спокойно выбирать, какую вы хотите. Мы вас ни в коем случае не ограничиваем. В этих 32 странах есть 288 университетов. Все университеты находятся в топе. Это лучшие мировые университеты. И по окончании вашего обучения вы должны будете вернуться в Россию и поработать в одной из организаций работодателей. На, данном, на данный момент их уже 567 в утвержденном списке. Ну, теперь про приятное. А максимальная сумма гранта, которую вы можете получить в год, это 2 миллиона 763 тысячи российских рублей. А в случае с PHD мы эту сумму умножаем на 4 или на 5 лет, в зависимости у кого какая программа. Вот на что идет наш грант? Он э, покрывает tuition fees и, и сопутствующие расходы living expenses. А вы можете тратить часть гранта на, на living expenses как угодно, за нее вы не отчитываетесь, то есть вы можете спокойно э, оплачивать, например, билеты до места э, обучения и обратно проживание, питание, страховку, литературу, если вам нужны какие-то реагенты и, может быть, что-то еще для экспериментов, пожалуйста, можете покупать, не нужно присылать нам чеки и отчитываться, что вот сегодня вы покушали там, а сегодня попозже покушали там, сходили в кино или что-то такое. Опять же, можете тратить часть гранта на сопутствующие расходы, как считаете нужным, лишь бы вам хватило денег. А, отчитываетесь вы только за оплату tuition fees, что у вас нет никакого долга, что вы все оплатили, университет не имеет к нам никаких претензий. Как я уже сказала, у нас финансируются 32 страны мира. Здесь можете видеть карту эм, со странами. 
которых у нас есть наши университеты. Здесь немного подробнее на слайде про количество университетов в каждой стране. В Великобритании у нас их 33. Полный список университетов и направлений, которые поддерживаются в каждом университете, можете найти на нашем сайте educationglobal.ru в разделе «Участнику», «Университеты» и «Образовательные программы». Все спрашивают, как мы отбирали эти университеты, почему именно эти, почему только эти программы. Отвечаем. Мы ориентировались на рейтинги, на QS, Education Times, шанхайский рейтинг. Все университеты входят в топ. 300, хотя бы двух из этих, из трех рейтингов. То есть мы предлагаем вам только самое лучшее. Все специальности были отобраны по QS Subject Ranking, все э, наши специальности входят в топ-200 этого рейтинга. Здесь, опять же, самое лучшее. Повторюсь, э, мы финансируем только graduate level, магистратуру, аспирантуру и ординатуру. К сожалению, грант не выдается на visiting research, visiting student, Uh, Различные internship, certificate programs, dual programs, joint programs. Нельзя одновременно обучаться в российской и зарубежной магистратуре. Сейчас можно uh, обучаться в двух отдельных аспирантурах, российской и зарубежной, но только в том случае, если это никоим образом не влияет на вашу успеваемость. И uh, две uh, аспирантуры не мешают друг другу. На этом слайде мы указали вам направление и программу обучения. Хочу сразу заметить, что это не полный список, не пугайтесь. Здесь есть ссылочка, потом презентацию всем вышли. Вы сможете перейти по ссылке и посмотреть полный перечень программ по всем направлениям. Так как сегодня мы говорим про PHD, мы решили посмотреть, кого же, каких же студентов у нас больше. И вот среди победителей у нас всего лишь 25% студентов аспирантуры. Мы считаем, что нужно это срочно исправлять, потому что нужно, друзья, уравнивать нам статистику. Здесь вы можете видеть наших прекрасных победительниц. Это Лиховцев, Лиховцева Евгения, которая обучается в Ирландии. Крушина Виктория обучается в Великобритании. Смолина Наталья, она обучается в Швеции. Um, так, здесь у нас Абакумов Дмитрий, он у нас в Бельгии, потом Дорохов Илья в Великобритании и uh, Яковлев Александр находится в Германии. Это не все наши победители, которые обучаются по программам PHD. Uh, просто решили вам показать uh, хотя бы несколько победителей. Пожалуйста, друзья, uh, поступайте, присоединяйтесь и надеюсь, что в скором времени буду показывать уже ваши фотографии на подобных вебинарах. Что нужно сделать, чтобы стать а, участником программы глобального образования? Во-первых, у вас должно быть гражданство Российской Федерации. Если у вас двойное гражданство, а, и ну, одно из них российское, это не проблема, пожалуйста, пусть вас это не останавливает, нам подходит. У вас должен быть как минимум бакалавр или специалист, а, может быть и выше, повторюсь, главное, чтобы был бакалавр. Пусть у вас хоть несколько кандидатских, пожалуйста, мы будем очень рады. Но, опять же, пусть будет бакалавр обязательно. Также у вас должен быть unconditional offer из одного из университетов по программе и направлению, которые внесены в наши списки. Может быть offer conditional, если, допустим, ну, вы еще либо не получили диплом, или университет не получил оригинал вашего диплома, такое нам подойдет. Или университет вам дает conditional offer на основании того, что они не знают, сможете ли вы профинансировать свое обучение или нет. Такой э, подходит. Но если у вас условия по языку, к сожалению, мы такой офер принять не можем, друзья. И мы ждем от вас согласия с условиями программы. Мы подразумеваем то, что вы должны будете вернуться в Россию и поработать в одной из организаций работодателей на протяжении трех лет. Здесь немножко подробнее про порядок участия в программе. Вы регистрируетесь на нашем сайте educationglobal.ru. Все очень удобно происходит, вам не нужно никуда ехать, особенно это удобно для тех, кто живет не в Москве. Пожалуйста, вы можете зарегистрироваться и погрузить все документы прямо сейчас, пока вы нас смотрите и слушаете. Вы регистрируетесь, подгружаете все документы в PDF, нажимаете кнопочку «Подать заявку», и как только заканчивается конкурсный отбор и проходит совещание наблюдательного совета, выходит протокол с вашим именем, вы подписываете соглашение, и вам перечисляется сумма гранта. Грант перечисляется единовременно, обратите, пожалуйста, на это внимание, в российских рублях, на российский счет, оформленный на ваше имя. 
Как только вы получаете грант, вы оплачиваете tuition fees, уезжаете учиться, проводите свои исследования, защищаете диплом и возвращаетесь потом в Россию и трудоустраиваетесь. Как я уже сказала, очень все удобно происходит. Заявки мы принимаем круглый год, однако решил обратить внимание на то, что у нас только четыре конкурсных отбора. Уже два прошли, сейчас идет третий, вот я его жирненьким выделила. Он начался 6 июня, закончится 21 августа 2016 года. Если вы хотите получить финансирование уже в этом году, вам нужно обязательно успеть подать заявку до 6 ноября этого года. Что значит подать заявку? То есть у вас должен быть unconditional offer из университета, который входит в наш список. Всю эту информацию можете в любой момент посмотреть на нашем сайте educationglobal.ru в разделе «Участнику». Это для вас самый информативный, наверное, раздел будет в будущем. Конкурсный отбор. На данный момент квота пока не выбрана, но она стремительно выбирается, и поэтому сейчас очень важно, чтобы у вас было место в электронной очереди. То есть кто первый зарегистрировался, того и тапки. Пожалуйста, если у вас еще нет этого номера, прошу вас очень зарегистрироваться и получить его. Как его получить? Вы должны обязательно заполнить графы в заявлении «Университет» и «Образовательная программа». Это все редактируется, друзья. Если вы, допустим, подаете в несколько университетов и ждете решения, все в порядке, вы заполните сразу несколько университетов, но главное заполните эти графы, чтобы система присвоила вам номер. Если эти графы не будут заполнены номером, вы не получите, соответственно, потом будете в конце очереди. Если вы поступаете по направлению наука и у вас есть публикации, пожалуйста, прикрепите это, очень важно. Но я хочу отметить, что публикации действительно только для направления наука. Все условия участия в программе вы можете в любой момент посмотреть на нашем сайте educationglobal.ru. Мы рекомендуем вам посмотреть соглашение до того, как вы приедете его подписывать, чтобы вы понимали, на что вы подписываетесь. Вы должны понимать, что вы должны будете предоставлять нам отчетность во время обучения, о чем мы говорим. Это бумаги из университета о том, что вас переводят из семестра в семестр, что все хорошо, у вас нет никаких долгов, ни учебных, ни по оплате tuition fees. Вы также должны будете вернуться в Россию в течение 30 дней с момента получения нашего диплома. Мы не будем встречать вас шариками с ваннерами в аэропорту, но просим понимать, что мы, программа федеральная, деньги выделяются из федерального бюджета на ваше обучение, поэтому ну, не думайте о миграции. Пожалуйста. Как только вы возвращаетесь в Россию, у вас будет три месяца на то, чтобы трудоустроиться в одну из организаций нашего списка. И работать там потом будете на протяжении трех лет. Не меньше, не больше, ровно три. Есть большое очень заблуждение, что мы заставляем вас работать 25 лет. Нет, это неправда. Три года отработаете, и больше у нас никаких к вам, собственно, претензий не будет. Вы, если захотите, можете остаться в данной организации. Если не захотите, вы можете уйти. Если вы вдруг решите, что возвращаться вы не хотите, или вдруг вы не получите, вы не закончите свое обучение, тогда все будет очень печально. Вы должны будете выплатить штраф в трехкратном размере от суммы, которую вы получите к тому моменту. Поэтому, друзья, давайте все-таки играть по-честному. Как я уже сказала, у нас 567 компаний в утвержденном списке на данный момент. Все это можно посмотреть, все адреса явки, пароли, организации, можете посмотреть на сайте educationglobal.ru, раздел участнику трудоустройства. Мы список выполняем на регулярной основе. Если у вас есть какая-то организация на примете, в которую вы потом бы хотели вернуться, пожалуйста, ее можно внести. Вы самостоятельно выбираете организацию, в которой будете работать. Мы, опять же, хочу развеять миф, еще один. Мы никуда насильно не направляем в организацию. Вы самостоятельно выбираете и потом там работаете. Бывает так, что вот вы что-то выбрали, и потом вам ну, либо не понравилось там, либо какие-то жизненные обстоятельства изменились, вам нужно, ну, допустим, переехать. Вы можете два раза на протяжении трех лет переходить из одной организации в другую, и в этом случае штраф накладываться не будет. Мы всячески вам поможем трудоустроиться, делаем все, что в наших силах. Как мы это будем делать? Как только вы отправитесь на учебу, вы будете заполнять анкетирование, где больше хотите работать, где меньше, где совсем не хочу. 
будете составлять нам резюме, которое впоследствии мы и вы будем рассылать по профильным организациям. Будем просить вас записать видеообращение для работодателей. Разместим его на нашем YouTube-канале. Не переживайте, никто не будет делать мемы с вами. Это для того делается, чтобы работодатели могли самостоятельно изучить ваши резюме. И, возможно, сами обрат... они иногда обращаются к нам, если им кто-то нравится, с просьбой э, ну как, дать контакты ваши, чтобы потом вас трудоустроить. Как я уже сказала, мы будем всячески помогать вам, э, будем трудоустраивать вас. Э, Headhunter будет размещать ваше резюме, ваше резюме будет всегда в топе, и вам не нужно будет за это платить, так как Headhunter наш ключевой партнер э, по трудоустройству. Вот, ваши режимы будут рассылаться в ведущие кадровые агентства. Опять же, мы помогаем, как только можем. Вот здесь можете найти всю информацию по трудоустройству на нашем сайте. Это скрин раздела по трудоустройству. Даже не знаю, стоит ли говорить о том, насколько глобальное образование – прекрасная программа. Только у нас есть свобода выбора лучших университетов и 32 стран мира. Мы принимаем заявки в течение всего года, сумма нашего гранта самая конкурентоспособная, мне кажется, и мы даем гарантию, если вы стали победителем, даже если вдруг, highly unlikely, если вдруг прекратят набор на программу, если вы стали победителем, то все ваши 4 или 5 лет профинансируют, то есть вы свое PhD закончите, благополучно вернетесь в Россию, так что не переживайте, и опять же, не нужно будет каждый раз, каждый год перепоступать и переподавать заявку снова. Один раз выиграли, все, гарантированная оплата вашего обучения. Мы будем всячески помогать вам и на этапах поступления, и потом на этапе трудоустройства, потом, когда вы закончите, вы будете принадлежать к клубу лучших выпускников мира, поэтому сплошные плюсы, друзья. Как я уже сказала, мы помогаем вам на этапе по поступлению. Мы проводим очные презентации и вебинары, как сегодня. Наш график мероприятий можете посмотреть на educationglobal.ru. Внизу странички будет календарь мероприятий. Мы всячески собираем и помогаем вам искать рекомендации по поступлению, крайние сроки подачи заявок в вузы, какие документы. Все это мы собрали в одном разделе educationglobal.ru, раздел «Участнику». Пожалуйста, смотрите, пользуйтесь. Не только мы э, совместно с университетами нашими, как сегодня с Орекс, Орексским, э, проводим мероприятие, а также проводит его и наше сертифицированное образовательное агентство. Э, если вы, допустим, э, сомневаетесь, что сами сможете поступить, пожалуйста, можете обратиться к агентам. Список агентов на нашем сайте, в вашем любимом разделе «Участнику». Пожалуйста, посмотрите. Они консультируют бесплатно по программе и по поступлению в зарубежные вузы. Также с нами активно сотрудничают международные образовательные культурные центры, такие как Campus France, Nufik Nasarash, Education USA, British Council, Goethe Institute, Australia и так далее. Мы собрали для вашего удобства все полезные ссылки по странам. Пожалуйста, ссылочку я вам тут тоже указала. Опять же, это ваш любимый раздел участников на нашем сайте educationglobal.ru, поэтому, я думаю, вы сориентируетесь. Вот так выглядит график наших мероприятий. Здесь размещаем не только... Мероприятия, которые проводим мы, оператор программы Московская школа управления Сколково, но и все наши партнеры, все наши агенты, все наши университеты, поэтому рекомендуем вам заглядывать туда почаще. Вот так выглядит э, наш раздел с рекомендациями по поступлению, там есть ссылочки на вебинары по сдаче языковых экзаменов и по поступлению в различные страны, пожалуйста, смотрите, мы ничего не прячем, всем делимся, все для вас, друзья. Если у вас возникнут вопросы, которые вы вдруг не сможете сегодня мне задать, всегда можете их направить на globaldiusколково.ru или позвонить нам на бесплатный телефон 8 800 50 56 23. Просим вас, друзья, однако, извините, пожалуйста, по московскому времени до 6 вечера. Мы тогда более активны. Подписывайтесь, пожалуйста, на нас в Фейсбуке, ВКонтакте, смотрите наши вебинары на Ютьюбе, если у вас нет возможности подключаться онлайн, когда мы их проводим. Всегда можете эту всю информацию найти на нашем официальном сайте программы educationglobal.ru. То давайте посмотрим ваши вопросы. Так, возрастного ценза у нас нет, Тимур. 
ну, как бы для программы нет сенса. По PHD это вам сейчас ответит Стивен. Я думаю, у нас самой опытной участнице 53 года исполнилось, когда она вот поступала и поехала на учебу. Так что мы будем очень рады, если вы станете нашим победителем. У нас есть мама с дочкой, которая учится в одном университете на разных программах, есть несколько семейных пар, так что, пожалуйста, подавайте заявку. А Алена, да, конечно, я вышлю не только свою презентацию, но и презентацию Ланы и Стивена. Все обязательно получите, как только мы сконвертируем видеозапись вебинара. Так. Есть ли еще вопросы, друзья? Вот так, вижу вопрос. Так, Алена, мы помощь в получении визы не оказываем, но наши образовательные центры иногда проводят различные семинары с сотрудниками посольства по получению визы. Если вы подразумеваете, что нужно от нас какое-то письмо, допустим, сопроводительное, мы, ну, если нужно, мы направляем письма в посольство о том, что вы являетесь участником программы, но вам уже нужно будет активно принимать участие в программе, то есть просто так мы его дать не сможем вам. Так. Тимур, мы финансируем только full-time programs, поэтому part-time, к сожалению, мы не сможем финансировать. Они в Орикский университет, вы можете их также направлять в чат, потому что я знаю, у нас есть представитель университета из Санкт-Петербурга, Надежда Гринищева, она нас слушает, я думаю, если что, она нам тоже поможет. Тимур, этот вопрос мы сейчас адресуем Лане. Yes, hello, hi there. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just reading the questions. We're discussing the sort of uh, PhD evaluation thing, mm -hmm. whether it's possible in the UK. Thank you very much, Lana, for... Uh, I, I guess, well, we should uh, wrap up because, well, no one seems to have any questions now. Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to say thank you, Lana, for organizing everything. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for Ooh. finding time. Thank you. I guess uh, it, it, it was very useful for our, our future PhD students. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, if you do have any other questions, please do contact myself. And I'll try and direct you to the, to the person here, uh, the most relevant person here at Warwick. If you can't find anybody of your struggling list, patient with some academics, but yeah. maybe we can find them sort of in, in touch with here internally or something like that. Yeah. Maybe. Thanks all. Thank you very much. Thanks I hope for joining us today. You have a good day, yes. everybody. And yeah, see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully see you soon. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Okay guys. Cheers, Bye. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye.